Right. Thank you very much, Professor Yuba, um, for, for this discussion. We are going um, to talk about a substance of, uh, of very grave concern um, for, uh, for many, many um, health issues. Uh, of course, um, I am referring to glyphosate and, and you uh, personally have been at the forefront of uh, this criticism of this uh, calling out a possible and probable dangers of that substance. Maybe, uh, Professor Huber, could you give us a short background um, for those listeners uh, over here in Europe who don't uh, know your, uh, of, of what your work has been so far and how you came um, to be concerned about glyphosate? Well, I, I'm a soil microbiologist, plant pathologist, plant disease specialist, uh, worked, worked for uh, almost 60 years of research in microbial ecology and other areas there. Also uh, have had quite an extensive involvement in human diseases and epidemiology. Uh, if you have healthy plants, you have healthy people. If you have healthy soils, you can have healthy plants. Uh, in 1974, when glyphosate was first uh, released and commercialized as an herbicide, uh, I started seeing things happening in the soil and, and from a plant disease standpoint that didn't fit the information that we were being provided from the company, both as far as its mode of action and its uh, impact on the environment. I was seeing some rather strange activities in the environment and especially the expression of increased severity of a number of plant diseases that if the mechanism that we were being told that this herbicide works was really the active ingredient or the active mechanism, uh, those activities, those processes should not occur. And yet uh, we're seeing them consistently. Uh, I initiated uh, some research just out of curiosity to see if maybe in understanding several of these diseases uh, that we managed primarily only through uh, nutrition and, and management uh, procedures that would influence nutrition was to see if I had missed something that would be of benefit to us in more effective control. The more research that I did then uh, the greater concern I had because this is a very unique chemical. It's a very simple chemical, very, uh, it's just a, a synthetic amino acid, the simplest of the amino acids, glycine, with the phosphonate group, a PO3 group on it. Turns out that that PO3 group uh, is not a, a normal, uh, component or a normal chemistry for most products in the environment. So this synthetic amino acid then be, behaves very different than it would if it had a, a phosphate group rather than the phosphonate group, a PO4 rather than a PO3. There are very few organisms in the environment that can degrade glyphosate. So that for one thing, it's very persistent in the environment. Uh, there are reports of uh, half-life as long as 22 years. And the Australian uh, government's testing of their soils here a few years ago, and we see this also in some of ours, that you can account for 20 years of glyphosate application in the soil today because there has been very little degradation or breakdown of, of this chemical because it's synthetic and we haven't had those generations of time for organisms to evolve that can break that carbon phosphonate linkage especially. That's usually the uh, sticking point from a degradation standpoint but it has many other very unique characteristics. It's considered a hundred year chemical 
because of its broad spectrum of activity, in spite of its very simple chemical composition. Uh, biologically, it's a very unique chemical, both for uh, in the soil, uh, in our plants, in our animals, and in our own bodies. It's a uh, very powerful mineral chelator. In other words, it can grab on to other elements, change their characteristics so that uh, they're either more soluble, less soluble. In this case, it makes uh, those essential minerals that we have to have for our physiology or biological systems all have to have those minerals. It makes them unavailable physiologically and that's how it really functions as an herbicide, as an antibiotic, and uh, as a general biocide is by depriving our enzymes of the cofactors of the keys that would turn them on or make them function. Uh, it merely immobilizes those minerals. Doesn't have to be highly involved in the chemistry of, of enzymes. Uh, because it uh, makes the key for those enzymes non-available and therefore uh, changes the physiology, changes the biology of the environment very dramatically, whether it's our gut microbiome, whether it's the soil, or whether it's the plant. Right. Has a similar effect there. Right. So you have already mentioned uh, its property as a chelator. Um, over here in Europe, um, the discussion about glyphosate has been a very strange one. Uh, anyone who raises concerns about this substance uh, is considered um, uh, simply like a quack or, or like a, a lay person who doesn't know anything about it and doesn't understand that this chemical is very safe to be used as um, uh, uh, as a help for the farmers in agriculture. Uh, now, uh, this of course refers to um, the um, the inventor of the uh, the company who first um, patented um, glyphosate as a herbicide, Monsanto, um, saying um, to politicians, to regulators all over the world. I think they are saying that. Um, Glyphosate is safe because it disrupts uh, a shikimate um, pathway, an enzymatic um, um, pathway, which humans don't have. Um, this is not the whole truth, is it? Would you please uh, explain us what, what does it mean when we're talking about a chelating agent and, and what makes glyphosate so unique uh, in even this um, function as a chelator? As a chelator, glyphosate was patented 10 years before Monsanto patented as an herbicide. It was used to clean steam pipes and boilers because it's able to grab on to your calcium, magnesium, and iron. Those minerals that tend to give you the scale can grab on to them, change their solubility or the ability to remove those in so that in uh, 1964, it was patented by Stauffer Chemical Company. Several other companies that also had patents as a mineral chelator to grab on to those minerals. But it's those minerals that have to be available then as the cofactors for our proteins. 80% of the proteins in our body or in a biological system are metalloproteins. That means that they have a metal element, an essential element that's associated with them that can be used for electron transfer as we see with, with our brain functions or as a cofactor, as I mentioned, the key for those enzymes that provide the catalyst then that the enzyme can function uh, with. So that it was first patented and used for, for cleaning steam pipes and boilers, 1964. 1974, that Monsanto patented it, and they actually went to Purdue University and asked a very well-known, very 
highly qualified uh, biochemist at, at Purdue University, where I was uh, located as a professor, and ask him if he would determine if this chemical uh, would inhibit the shikimate pathway. Now the shikimate pathway is secondary metabolism for <clears throat> all biological systems except mammals. Mammals are the only uh, uh, living entity or biological uh, system that doesn't have the innate characteristics or capabilities for the shikimate pathway. Now they didn't ask him how many other enzymes it might influence. To my knowledge, they asked him if it would inhibit the shikimate pathway, which of course it does. It's a very strong manganese uh, chelator, which is required for the FMN cofactor. You have to have a reduced FMN and the FMN reductase enzyme that provides that actual cofactor for the EPS enzyme in the shikimate pathway has to have the reduced FMN. So glyphosate actually chelates that manganese. It also chelates with cobalt, which is another enzyme right at the start of the shikimate pathway. So that there are many enzymes that it actually shuts down in the shikimate pathway, but also outside of that pathway. It does it by chelating, by pulling the key out of the ignition on those enzymes, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, that has ramifications then for all biological systems. Even though mammals don't have the shikimate pathway, all of our aromatic amino acids, there are three essential aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine, that are required for biological systems. All of our uh, neural chemistry originates with tri through tryptophan. We have hormone systems and other things that originate through uh, phenylalanine and through tyrosine. So if they're essential amino acids for us, but we can't synthesize them ourselves. For mammals, those, in, those amino acids are synthesized by our gut microbiology. The bacteria in our GI tract are the organisms that provide us with our amino acids. Now we get a few from plants, from uh, seeds and other, other uh, sources there, but it's primarily from the microorganisms in our GI tract. So when they say, well, it can never be toxic to humans or to uh, mammals because we don't have the shikimate pathway, uh, it's only partially true. In our cells, we don't have it, but in our GI tract, which we now refer to as our eighth organ, because there are 10 times more cells in our GI tract and our gastrointestinal system than there are in the rest of our bodies. It's very critical for us if you, when you have gut dysbiosis or a change in the balance in those organisms in your GI tract, we have all kinds of mental problems like bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, depression, all of those we have that's, but the GI tract is also the source for our immune system. So that uh, we then become very susceptible to many of the pathogens also in our GI tract, the Clostridium botulinum that causes uh, sudden infant death syndrome or that causes uh, chronic fatigue syndrome or leaky gut and inflammatory bowel from uh, Clostridium butyricum and Clostridium botulinum, Clostridium perfringens. All of those organisms are resistant to glyphosate, but all of the organisms that we rely on for nutrition, for our, our uh, neural 
uh, chemistry, all of those functions, all of those organisms are very dependent on having those minerals available. And glyphosate is very toxic as a very powerful broad spectrum antibiotic against the beneficial organisms in our GI tract as well as in uh, the stomach or the intestinal tract of animals and bees and, and uh, uh, lizards and bats and all other uh, organisms have to have those uh, minerals and glyphosate is a very toxic antibiotic against the beneficial organisms that would provide that support for all living systems essentially. Right. Um, you have mentioned the immune system, which is um, stemming from our intestinal um, tract, from our microbiome. Um, there is a very close connection between our innate immune system and the immune system, which uh, we get from, um, from the bacteria uh, we are providing a home to, if you, uh, if you allow this expression. There is, uh, in terms of toxicity um, of glyphosate on the field, out, out in the field, there is also a similarity, at least if I understood correctly what you have been um, lecturing about in various talks I have uh, had the privilege of listening to on the internet. So there you say that also the plant is not killed by glyphosate itself. Uh, you, in one talk, you mentioned that plant in sterile soil cannot be killed by glyphosate, but that the killing um, also takes place by an impairment of uh, the plant's immune system. Can you elaborate on this, maybe? Yes. Uh, again, the shikimate pathway is secondary metabolism. It's not a primary metabolism that would kill directly. <clears throat> but it is responsible for much of the defense mechanism that the plant has against soil-borne pathogens. So that this would be your fungal and bacterial pathogens that are in the soil, cause disease, and uh, it's very toxic to the organisms that would normally suppress those uh, soil-borne diseases but it stimulates the pathogens. Some of those pathogens are a few of the organisms that can actually utilize glyphosate as a nutrient resource, but their virulence, their ability to cause disease is greatly increased, and it's a very rapid colonization because these organ organisms are common in almost all of our soils, uh, you put a little bit of glyphosate on the leaf of a, of a soybean plant, for instance, and in a matter of three to four hours, it's already moving out of the, soil, out of the root system into the soil where it, its antibiotic activity suppresses the normal biological control organisms that would suppress the pathogens would control the, those disease organisms. And those are taken out of the picture, out of the ecology, and you then have a stimulation of the fungi uh, that the Fusarium and Rhizoctonia, uh, Pythium, Phytophthora, all of those uh, many soil-borne disease organisms that then are no longer suppressed, they're no longer in jail, in the soil, you open the door for them, and it's a matter of just a very few hours before they have colonized that uh, plant that now has AIDS, if you want to look at it that way. Its immune system has been compromised, its de defenses have been shut down, so that, that that plant is very rapidly colonized. This is one of the reasons why it takes four to five days or maybe even a little longer to kill the plants when they're treated with glyphosate. It's not uh, like pouring acid on them or uh, 
vinegar, a weak acid, some of those things that we do use that are fairly quick in acting, just uh, a few hours and the plant becomes brown. Uh, the plant treated with glyphosate first becomes yellow uh, as the minerals are all tied up and as those enzyme systems are compromised or as they're shut down. And then it's the organisms, the soil-borne organisms that uh, come in and finish off the plant or that uh, destroy those tissues that have no defense against that the extracellular enzymes and the penetration of the mycelium of the fungus and, and those things. So that its mode of action is very unique, very different than uh, many of our uh, chemical weed killers, which do have a primary mode of action uh, as an herbicide. If you read the 1995 review on glyphosate, uh, and this is 20 years after it was commercialized as an herbicide, they state that the glyphosate inhibits the shikimate pathway, but the herbicidal mode of action is actually unknown. Well, it was known 10 years before that, there are a number of papers showing uh, uh, as I stated, that you can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil because it's the fungi that kill it. You give the plant a bad case of AIDS and then shut down the defense mechanism and it's those soil-borne organisms that kill the, do the actual killing of the plant. I've demonstrated this and others have demonstrated it in various ways. If you bl block the movement of glyphosate into the root system by uh, severing the vascular system, uh, it will only stunt the plant for several weeks and then as it recovers those minerals from the soil that have been chelated, it will resume growth and take off. All of your lateral buds will take off and you end up with a big bush there. Uh, glyphosate has to move down, has to compromise the immune system or the defenses of the plant and stimulate the uh, soil-borne fungi by changing the soil ecology. It's not just working on one organism or two organisms, it's really a very dramatic change in the soil biology just as it has a very dramatic change in our GI tract and our uh, own intestines and, and uh, colon that you'll find people with gout, for instance, as uh, Dr. Seneff has a recent paper on, shows that people with gout have a very different microbiome in their GI tract than people who don't have gout. Uh, when you have glyphosate, it changes that whole relationship because of its uh, toxicity, antibiotic activity against the beneficial organisms, and its stimulation of the uh, organisms that are very deleterious to us, the pathogens in that. Thank you for this um, explanation. Um, from listening to um, your um, words, it is evident uh, that you clearly know what you're talking about. And uh, this, of course, uh, is no coincidence. You uh, have been a professor um, at Purdue University, which is one of uh, the most respected and well-known universities in the United States of America. Um, so it is uh, very hard for, uh, for critics uh, to question your a scientific um, uh, capacity. However, there are few um, scientists uh, who are uh, teaching or researching at universities um, over the globe who are as outspoken uh, as you are. Um, and those who are outspoken, as you mentioned, Dr. Stephanie Sennett from MIT in Boston, um, are being um, uh, personally uh, uh, degraded um, uh, because they uh, 
don't hold any capacity in a formal way it, uh, which uh, um, recognizes uh, their expertise uh, on this matter. What is the reason behind this? Can you, can you give us a clue? Uh, follow the money. If you, uh, if you, uh, well, again, if you follow the money, you'll see a direct correlation there. There's a tremendous amount of money involved here. I happened to be at a stage in my career that uh, it was difficult for them to damage me. They can damage my reputation perhaps uh, uh, somewhat, but I think I have already uh, set my mark from a scientific standpoint for a young person who has come out and we've had a number of them who did try to to report their research as they were seeing it as it was uh, unfolding for them uh, many of them lost their jobs they've been uh, uh, punished as a result of publishing that we have one scientist that published his research showing the requirement for much higher levels of minerals uh, when glyphosate was involved in the production program. Uh, he did this so that his growers would know that if they were using the new technologies and those things that they had to compensate for that reduced nutrient efficiency that was present when you change the soil biology, you change the availability of nutrients, change the pathogens. And uh, when this scientist uh, at a very well-known uh, university in the, in the States uh, published his data so that his growers would be able to use the technology and not compromise their quality or their the yield of their crops, uh, two months later he had to uh, sent in a letter to the editor of the journal that he had published in and apologized for publishing his data. He said he didn't understand the unintended consequences of publishing your science to benefit the producers that you were doing the science for. We have many who have lost their jobs totally. And so, uh, uh, it just depends on where you are in your career, on what the impact's going to be. Uh, I've been blessed, I guess, because I was at that stage in my career and also had other capacity or other uh, assignments that uh, I didn't have to worry about the punitive aspects. I had support from my dean. He did let me know that, that they were that the companies were not happy with me, with my research, even though some of those I had consulted uh, on other scientific areas for 15 or 20 years. Uh, when I started taking a stand on this very unique chemical that has extremely deleterious impact on our environment, that we rely on for our survival as well as uh, our direct health effects. Uh, they weren't happy with me. And uh, my dean and my department head both let me know that uh, uh, I was uh, a target in those areas, but I also felt at least from the dean, not so much from my department head, but from from the dean at least, I had his support. I recognized the value of the research, its importance, and uh, encouraged me to uh, make sure that it was sound, make sure that it was, uh, uh, all the principles of science were adhered to, uh, but uh, to do that, which my scientific training would, uh, tell me would be beneficial to the growers and to our society as a whole. Uh, so I was very, I was somewhat unique in that capacity at Purdue University. I also had the opportunity to work as a member of scientific teams. 
so that it wasn't just my research, but there were many others that were involved in that research that uh, I could call on for support, uh, even though some of them had to be very careful how they responded and they had to uh, uh, at times appear that uh, uh, they weren't associated. Those are things that become part of the politics of academia or part, part of the politics of agriculture uh, there and you just don't worry about them. You do what's right and you uh, continue on you remain friends, you're honest with each other, uh, and honest in your science, and continue. Now, many, as I said, have sacrificed uh, their jobs, their reputation. Uh, uh, you'll find it a common practice that if, if you can't argue with the data, you challenge the messenger. And that's just a standing operating procedure for some of the companies uh, in these areas. If it uh, affects their bottom line, they're not very concerned about what it does to health or what it, what it does to uh, the overall agricultural system or health of the population. As long as uh, the dollar continues to flow their direction, that seems to be the criteria that's used uh, now. That wasn't the criteria that I found with many of these companies 30 or 40 years ago. That appears to be the uh, modus operandi or the basis for the things they're doing now as we see the uh, stacking of genetics, uh, uh, different herbicides, mixing of those herbicides, uh, endocrine hormone disruptors. <clears throat> a very different system now. Uh, grateful I had an opportunity to uh, work in a system where I had the support. Uh, I was encouraged to be honest in my science. I could be outspoken uh, as long as that science was correct. I had the support that I needed as a scientist and uh, I felt I could do what was right. Uh, well, we tried to do that anyway, so that wasn't a challenge for me. Thank you for these uh, explanations, Professor Huber. Um, in terms of challenges and in terms of um, hope, uh, can you can you give us um, an uh, impression of what options are there? Um, is uh, what is being done with glyphosate to the environment, is it in any way reversible? What can the ordinary citizen uh, do um, uh, to, uh, to help in a change of awareness? A few years ago, I would have said, uh, uh, it's a one-way street. We're going downhill very rapidly. Uh, in the last few years, I see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. In some of my presentations, I uh, feel like I get them to that deer in the headlight type of an expression where you have a deer running out in front of your car and, and you have the shock reaction. They're not aware of the serious implications of glyphosate on the environment and on our own personal health and family's health. Uh, and it's easy to, to point those out, to show them. We have all kinds of examples of serious health consequences. So that uh, uh, at the time or a few years ago, we didn't have the information that we have now showing that there are ways to remediate. Uh, and searching for organisms that would break down glyphosate. I found that there were very few of them. They were kind of few and far between in that ecology, uh, uh, so that it looked like we would need to have mixtures or biological cocktails of at least six organisms 
in order to start breaking down the residual glyphosate that was accumulating in our soils if we were going to continue to even be able to uh, produce our crops. Uh, I was involved in uh, visiting with many farmers who have found that there are certain crops they can't even grow on their soils now and meet the market demand for low glyphosate levels because the residual levels are so high that if they get any kind of desorption of that stored glyphosate in the soil, it's taken up by the plant and their crop is rejected from excess glyphosate levels. And very serious concern also uh, uh, their wheat and their barley plants that aren't uh, genetically engineered for tolerance to glyphosate were dying before harvest time, some of them only four or five inches tall before they would die from the uh, residual glyphosate in the soil. This wasn't supposed to occur if you listen to the company in 1974, 1975. We were told first that it's safe enough to drink and the second thing was that it's poof and it's gone. Well, we know now that that's not the case. Half-life, again, can be uh, any, a year and a half to as long as 22 years. If that's a half-life, we're talking uh, a generation or two. We know that there are certain organisms now that can degrade it, both in the soil as well as in our uh, uh, plants and, and uh, food production system. Uh, they're still not very common in our and the ecology, but we can increase that availability in the soil so that we can get some of that degradation. We can also use some uh, probiotic type approaches. In fact, we have over 30 diseases that are directly correlated with the uh, exposure to glyphosate or the GMO proteins. With at least uh, 22 of those diseases, the best treatment or the most effective treatment that we have today is a fecal transplant. Well, it doesn't sound very good, but what you're doing then is you're flushing out your GI tract. You're trying to recolonize with a healthy gut microbiome to get rid of the pathogens and those organisms that are creating the health problem, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease or whether it's uh, autism, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's or whether it's uh, uh, difficile diarrhea, any number of these diseases, there are uh, 22 of these very critical diseases now that are reaching epidemic proportions that are all can all be uh, effectively reversed with a, a fecal transplant if it's a proper transplant. Now, there's also a hazard there. If you get a, a microbiome from someone that may not express the symptoms, but your body being very unique may let those other organisms express themselves so that you can also have some negative reactions to that. But it's a positive in 95% of the time for those 22 diseases, including diabetes. Uh, if you change your diet, if they don't change the diet, then it's a very transient type of an effect because the glyphosate levels in our food are up to 4,000 times higher then the science shows will cause gut dysbiosis or the antibiotic activities of the glyphosate will remove the beneficial organisms and again put you in that same health status that you had before with the pathogens uh, overriding your beneficial organisms. So uh, <clears throat> it's a very powerful antibiotic, very uh, extensive scope of the damage that that antibiotic does in the environment and in our bodies. Now we're concerned about excess antibiotic use. 
in agriculture, we use about 29 million pounds of streptomycin, actinomycin, cephalosporins, and other uh, antibiotics for disease control or pathogen control. Uh, <clears throat> but we use half a billion pounds of this very broad spectrum antibiotic we call glyphosate in the indiscriminately in the environment. It's also been shown that the glyphosate will induce resistance in other organisms to all of the other antibiotics. So that just having the glyphosate present creates an antibiotic crisis for us from a health standpoint of pathogen control. In addition to that, it also stimulates those same pathogens to become more virulent. It changes the biology, the ecology. Uh, it has changed dramatically where we would normally have suppression of those uh, pathogenic organisms by the beneficials. And now we see the pathogens are even expressing themselves in our food supply to measures or to levels that we had never experienced in the past. We see uh, contamination of lettuce, of cantaloupes, of uh, uh, many of our fruit products, and especially our root uh, uh, crops are, and that, because the glyphosate at such extremely low levels changes that soil biology to favor the pathogens. And these, I'm not talking about just the plant pathogens, but also the human pathogens then that are carried on those uh, food products because we no longer have the beneficial organisms that would have eliminated or prevented that colonization to start with. Wow. Dr. Huber, thank you very much for, for these explanations, for this uh, insight into a uh, very, very important uh, matter. I think uh, at least that's what we are trying to do on this program is um, to uh, make available these kind of um, expert um, knowledge, expert insight um, to raise awareness um, because it is important that uh, the uh, general public um, learn about um, what has been neglected over the um, decades already uh, um, with uh, um, uh, with the glyphosate issue. So your contribution is extremely important, uh, very much uh, welcome, and um, we are grateful to have had you um, on this program. Thank you very much. Well, I, I would thank you. I'd be derelict if I didn't mention that you have had some uh, outstanding scientists in Germany, uh, Volker Romheld, uh, uh, Newman, Dr. Monica Kruger has been a tremendous help to us in our uh, approach and understanding of the animal and human diseases. But uh, Dr. Kruger and Shihata and, and the uh, uh, team that she had there at Leipzig University a uh, tremendous scientist that added uh, a dimension that I don't know of anyone else in the world that has made that depth of contribution in understanding the power of this antibiotic uh, glyphosate as a mineral chelator, as an antibiotic, but as a general disruptor of the beneficial ecology that we all uh, rely on. Uh, and I certainly personally have benefited from their research, from their friendship, association that I've been privileged to have, but uh, some tremendous science that uh, you've been able to contribute for the rest of the world in understanding uh, what's happening now in such a, a subverted manner to uh, compromise 
health throughout the world because of the indiscriminate application and use of this strong mineral chelator and powerful antibiotic uh, that we're exposed to now. That's very kind of you and, and also um, very telling about your humble and um, uh, team oriented uh, approach. Um, thank you very much for these words and um, God bless you, all the rest to you, uh, Dr. Yuba. Thanks. Well, best, best wishes. Thank you for this opportunity.